Well, the sense it does in Christ. Let us come before God as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of hearing your word today. May your Holy Spirit help us understand your word. Help us to know who you are and cause our hearts to respond in obedience and worship. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever found yourself in a dead-end situation? Situation where you feel totally trapped and totally helpless and you have no way to get out of it. So there's this guy. He's a mountaineer or an outdoor adventurer by the name of Aaron Ralston who told of his dead-end story in a book which was later made into a film called 127 Hours. Have you watched this film before? It's about one fateful day as Aaron was climbing alone deep in the Grand Canyons and he accidentally dislodged a big boulder or a big rock that weighed more than 300 kg. And what happened is that this rock fell together with him and ended up smashing on his right hand. And to his horror, he realized that he couldn't lift the boulder and he couldn't set himself free. Just like what the picture on the right shows. He's completely stuck. He's deep in the Grand Canyons and you can imagine how vast the place is. And the worst thing is, nobody can rescue him because nobody knows his exact location. And so if you were to watch this movie, it has only one scene throughout this whole movie, the, the two hours. It's about him being stuck and he's trying to free himself for 137 hours. It has more than five days. And in order to free himself, he, out of sheer desperation, finally he amputated his own right arm. I guess this is not your kind of stay home weekend movie to watch. Well, thankfully, most of us will never end up in such a literal dead end, being physically trapped. What are some of the dead ends that we might face? Okay, for me, preparing this sermon already feels like a dead end. <laughs> so I guess I'm leaving out my sermon. Well, some dead ends come to us unexpectedly. So, for example, discovering that a loved one has a major illness. Some others are what we face day by day. So, for example, a difficult boss that we have to face every single day. Or if you are a student, perhaps an overwhelming subject in school, and it feels like a dead end to you. For some others, it's relationships. Okay, maybe a strained friendship that can never go back to the way it once was. Now, this morning, as we study Exodus chapter 14 and 15, we find the Israelites encountering a dead end as well. And through the crossing of the Red Sea, they will discover who their God is. He is the Lord of dead ends. And as we begin, let us keep in mind this big question that we will ask throughout the passage. What is God revealing about himself in your dead end? What is God revealing about himself in your dead end? And the first thing we find in this, okay, in verse 1 to 12, chapter 14, it says the Lord is graciously leading you. Okay, the Lord is graciously leading you. So as we recall where we ended off last week in chapter 13, the Lord had just victoriously led his people out of the land of Egypt after performing the ten plagues. Okay, but as soon as we come to chapter 14, the situation seems to have reversed completely. So look at verse 1. The Lord told Moses, that the Israelites are to do what? They are to turn back and encamp in front of this place called Pai Padibo, okay, between Mindo, which is an Egyptian fortress, and the Red Sea. So essentially, they are being led to this place, which we can say is an, there's an impassable Red Sea in front of them. Behind them is an impenetrable fortress, the Egyptian fortress. Surrounding them are the mountains, okay, inaccessible terrain. What do you call this? You call this a dead end. Okay, but notice that the Israelites didn't land in this situation because of their disobedience or a miscalculation on their part. Rather, this is a dead end that is brought about entirely by God's purposeful leading. Okay, God's purposeful leading. So we ask, what are God's purposes in leading His people to this dead end? 
And the first purpose is told to Moses in verse 3 and 4. It's actually a ploy to make Pharaoh pursue the Israelites. And ultimately it is to, to magnify his glory. When God will have his victory over Pharaoh and his armies. And you know this is God's key motivation because it's repeated again down the verses in 17 and 18. I will get my glory over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. So the first purpose is to magnify his glory, and God's second purpose is actually to refine the Israelites' faith. Okay. You will see this because the Israelites will go from fear and grumbling in verse 10 to 12 to believing by the end of the chapter. And so through this day end, there will be a change in their hearts right, and in their relationship with God. And so this is where we will focus on in this section, on the Israelites' response. What do they believe God is doing in their day end? So let us flip our Bible and look at verse 10 to 12. It says that when they have lifted up their eyes and upon seeing the Egyptian armies, it caused their hearts to fear greatly in verse 10. What the Israelites saw was their persistent and formidable enemies in verse 5 to 9. And it tells us that Pharaoh has goldfish memory, a goldfish memory or short term memory. He's forgotten that God has just done all the ten plagues against his nation by his mighty hand. And now he's changed his mind. Okay, he's decided he's not just going to let the Israelites go which is a very good source of cheap labor force to him. So he gathered all his chariots, and it's mentioned there are 600 chosen ones. Right, 600 chosen ones, and we are not even counting the other chariots, the rest of the chariots. So altogether, probably thousands of them. Okay, the most fearsome army in the world, armed with the most technologically advanced war machines ever invented up to their time. And now they are pursuing the Israelites. And as God's people face the impassable Red Sea before them, their only option seems to be either they will drown or they will die. And so this feels like what? This feels like a, a God forsaken situation. Right? Seems like God has utterly forsaken them. And secondly, it seems like a cruel joke from God, isn't it? Because what just happened before this? One moment they were departing gloriously out of the land of Egypt, departing victoriously, and the next moment God plunges them into a dead end, into the depths of this pen. Has this happened to you before? Maybe God bless you with a relationship or a job or a business that went so well at first, and now He seems to be taking everything away, he seems to be withdrawing His blessing. And so in great fear, they grumble to Moses. Okay, and you notice that it's full of bitterness and full of sarcasm. Right? So the Bible also has sarcasm, sarcastic people. And they say, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Didn't we say, leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians and to die in the wilderness. Now, of course, the Egyptians are well known for their funerals, their graves. They are the experts in the pyramids and the mummies. So essentially, the Israelites are complaining sarcastically, God, you have such a what sense of humor. Because if you wanted us to die, you could have just left us in Egypt, where there are no lack of graves. Why free us only to let us die now? And then surprisingly, they prefer to go back to live as slaves rather to die in freedom as the children of God. So what can we call Israel's attitude? They call this spiritual forgetfulness, where they can't see God's faithfulness and a superficial faith, where they can't see God's goodness in times of trouble. Spiritual forgetfulness, superficial faith. Unable to see God's faithfulness nor His goodness when trouble comes. So if we read Psalms 106, verse 7, 
it actually has a strong judgment on their attitude. So it says, Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but they rebelled by the sea, by the Red Sea. So it seems that not only Pharaoh has goldfish memory, but the Israelites also have goldfish memory. They have forgotten all of this. They have forgotten God's promises to them in chapter 6. Right? And he has heard their cry, and he's going to redeem them from slavery and perform great acts of judgment. Right? Forgotten God's promise. They have also forgotten so quickly God's power. The power of God demonstrated against the Egyptians in the ten plagues, all the way from chapter 7 to chapter 12. And they have forgotten also just one chapter earlier. God's very presence with them in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. And He's always there guiding them. They have forgotten that God has never forsaken them and He has never failed them. Now, is this familiar to us? How many of us think that life is easier after becoming Christian? If anything, we have more difficulties to face. Right? Okay, we have trials, we have persecution, rejections to face. And not only that, as Christians, we have our own persistent, formidable enemies constantly surrounding us, cornering us. Sin is always crouching at the door. Satan is always prowling like a roaring lion, seeking to devour us. And his goal is to see us turn away from God. When life is hard, are we not also tempted like the Israelites to just give up? Just give up and go back to our old sinful way of life, which seems easier and seems more attractive. And for some of us in this room, it's alright to follow God. Right? Following God is fine as long as our studies go well, our careers go well, we get to live and retire well, just like everyone else. And like the Israelites, what kind of God do we want? We want this. Like the Israelites, we want to save God. A save God who only bless us and never give us the ends, never give us any trouble. But if God were to disrupt our comfortable lives, then we too start questioning in our hearts like the Israelites. God, is God really faithful? Is God really good to us? And so this quote from C.S. Lewis, the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, the character Aslan the Lion, as we know, is a representation of who Jesus is. And so at one point, one of the characters, that is Susan, asked Mr. Beaver about this Aslan that she's about to meet. And then she said, Is he quite safe? Is Aslan a safe lion? Because I feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And Mr. Beaver replied to her, Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. And that's C.S. Lewis' description of who God is. He's not a safe God who will never give us trouble, but he's always good. And so what exactly is God doing in our dead hands? It's not a safe God that he will just leave us comfortably where we are. Sometimes in God's goodness, God plunges us into their hands because He's graciously rescuing us from sin. It's not just rescuing us from enemies on the outside, but He's rescuing us from sin on the inside. And He's graciously refining our faith. So sometimes God plunges us into their hands to graciously rescue us from sin and to refine our faith. It's like what He's doing to the Israelites. So, application here. In your dead ends, ask how God is changing us and trust His gracious living. In your dead ends, ask how God is changing us and trust His gracious living. Don't just ask God to deliver us from our circumstances. Ask Him also if He's also changing something inside of us. So to give an example, if you keep struggling at your workplace, if you keep clashing with everyone, your boss, your colleagues, and you blame everything. Maybe the problem was never with your boss. It was never with 
the colleagues or the system that you're against with. But the problem was with your own typhoon heart, which you hate to submit to authority. And God is leading you through this day and to help you understand and help you help to rescue you from your own type. Or for some of us, perhaps our dead end is God's way of rescuing us from spiritual forgetfulness or from a superficial faith where we only want God to bless us and we only want God to give us a comfortable life. Sometimes God plunges us into dead ends because He doesn't just want us to know Him superficially, but He's leading us, graciously leading us like the Israelites, one step at a time. To trust him as our faithful father who will never forsake us in our difficulties. So what do we find? God is a God of the hands and he is always graciously leading us. As we move on, we find the second thing about God in our day. If we find that the Lord will fight for you. Verse 13 to 31, the Lord will fight for you. So after hearing the Israelites grumbling, in verse 13, Moses responds to the fearful Israelites, and he says this. He says, Fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. Fear overwhelms us whenever our problems are too big and our God is too small. So Moses said, the first thing you do is uh, empty out fear in your hearts. Empty out fear. And how do you do that? By doing the second thing. Stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord. So in other words, look towards God and what he's about to do. Okay, so imagine you are one of the sarcastic Israelites. Okay, you are hearing this from Moses, your leader. And what will you say to him? Okay, you say something like, are you kidding? Are you kidding or not? Okay, you have one job. Come up with a solid better plan. And this is what you got. Stand still and do nothing. Because no military strategies will ever tell you. Just stand there. Just stand still and do nothing. But here Moses is saying, well, the only thing you have to do is to look towards God. Which is at once the easiest thing to do. Because you are just looking. But also the hardest thing to do, isn't it? Because often on one extreme, we are busy trying to solve our problems with our own wisdom, our own ability. And at the other extreme, we can be completely paralyzed by our circumstances. So either out of self-dependence or out of self-pity, we end up being so self-focused that we can't look towards God. To look towards God is to give up control and say that God, I can't handle this problem on my own because I'm weak. And so I'm handing this over to you because you are the one who is strong and you are the one who is in control of everything. But ultimately the commands by Moses to empty out fear, to look upon God and then later on in verse 15, to go forward in faith those things only make sense if God's promises can be trusted. Okay? Otherwise, Moses is just selling us something, like a good salesman. You know, in English we say, Moses is selling us koyo. Okay? If there's no substance to what he's saying, if his words are just wishful thinking or blind optimism at best, everything hangs upon the promise of verse 14. What does verse 14 say? says the Lord will fight for you. The Lord will fight for you. This is Moses telling us that God is relentlessly on your side. Or in New Testament language, it's Romans chapter 8 verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? So you will see salvation. Your enemies, the Egyptians, will never be seen again. Because why? Because the Lord will fight for you. And you have only to be silent. So in other words, stop grumbling. Stop your grumbling because God is going to do something. And just watch what He's going to do. So the rest of us of chapter 14 belongs to God. 
after telling us Scripture is now showing us how God fights for his people. And as we've seen, God does it. He single-handedly defeated the Egyptians. You can see this from verse 19 all the way to verse 29. God single-handedly defeated the Egyptians. So you notice all the action words, if you were to underline every single one of them, who is doing those things? It's coming from God himself. And only on two occasions, Moses raises his staff. If I even then it's done under God's direction, it's done under God's power. Okay, so let us go through one by one. The key action words, verse 19 to 20. God in the pillar of cloud, he came in between the Israelite and Egyptian camps to separate the two camps, as God protected his people through the entire night. Okay, so you have to remember this is about two million people, Israelite men, women and children. Okay, two million of them, it would have taken the entire night to just cross the river. And God was doing what? All this while he was protecting Israel. And then verse 21, God supernaturally drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night. And he divided the sea, just like what we see in this picture here. <laughs> supernaturally divided the sea so that the Israelites can walk through on dry ground. A wall of water on their left and a wall of water on their right. And then what happens as the Egyptians pursued with all the chariots and horsemen, verse 24 says, in the morning watch, as the sun appears. It's mentioned because this is where the Egyptian sun god, by the name of Ra, is supposed to be at the climax of his power. Okay, so here you see a picture of him. He has a symbol of the sun over his head. One of the most powerful Egyptian gods, according to their belief. But of course, Ra didn't show up. And it was the Lord Yahweh who threw the Egyptians into panic and struck them embarrassingly at the heart of their power and their mighty chariot wheels so that they can hardly even move. And at this point, even the Egyptians are forced to leave. That the Lord is doing what? He's fighting for his people, right? Just as Moses has said earlier, God is fighting for his people. And verse 27 continues, and God powerfully threw all the Egyptians into sea and drowned them in a flood of judgment. And it's mentioned again in verse 28 that not a single, not a single enemy remained. Again, as Moses had promised earlier. The final conclusion in verse 30. Thus the Lord has saved Israel that day. So what is the implication of the Red Sea crossing? What is the implication of all of this? You can say this. If the Lord of the ends gets all the glory because he has fought for his people and defeated their enemies and that there is nothing, absolutely nothing that is too difficult for God to do. Right? The Lord of the end gets all the glory. There's nothing too difficult for God to do. But God did everything and then we ask, what did the Israelites do? Surely they must have contributed something, right? So look at verse 29. The only action word for the Israelites is they walk over. Okay, that's it. They simply walk over because their powerful God was doing all the rest. And by the end of the crossing in verse 30 and 31, they all saw the dead Egyptians and the great power of God. And they too, they feared and believed. So familiar verse to us, Hebrews 11 verse 29. When you look back on the Exodus, it says, By faith the people cross the Red Sea as on dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, they were drowned. Here we see that the destinies of the Israelites and Egyptians cannot be more different. One crossed over safely, and the other drowned in judgment. It's not that the Israelites were better people, right? Not that they were better than the Egyptians. Because we saw earlier how they too, they rebelled faithlessly earlier. They crossed over only because God was fighting for his people. And he was relentlessly on their side. And so what is salvation? 
salvation is crossing over by grace, by grace alone, because God did everything, and there was nothing that they contributed to their salvation. And also we can see this. We can see that Exodus is a picture of our own salvation. Right? The cross is the new and better Exodus. The new and better Exodus. Because Jesus graciously saved us from our ultimate death. He led us out of our slavery to sin. The cross is the new and better Exodus. Because Jesus has graciously saved us from our ultimate death. And so, what kind of dead end are you in today? Whatever dead end you and I think we are facing now, okay, whether it is our relationship, our work, or financial situation, there is no situation that we are more desperate in, more helpless in, than in our ultimate dead end. That we are slaves to sin, and we are dead in sin. It's not just that we are sinning in something, it's that we cannot not sin in everything. We are unable not to sin, and we are unable to free ourselves from them. Only Jesus has the power to save us from this ultimate dead end and lead us out of slavery to sin, to freedom and eternal life in God. So the application here is look towards God. Look towards God to save you from your sins, your ultimate dead end. Because at the cross, the flood of judgment that should have fallen upon you because you were an enemy of God, rebelling against Him. That flood of judgment fell on Jesus instead, who absorbed sin's punishment for you, so that you can now do this. You can now cross over by grace from death to life. And you rose again victoriously three days later. So if you are not yet a believer, there's only one thing that we need to do. Look towards Jesus. Trust that He took the punishment for your sin and you will be saved. Second, for the rest of us, trust all your big problems to an even bigger God. Trust all your big problems to an even bigger God. We live in an incredibly stressed out nation, right? So if you look at the news just this month alone, if you see something like this, See that there's suicides, youth suicides is especially among the youth is becoming higher from last year, becoming a worrying trend. Our work life balance is one of the worst in the world. We're one of the most overworked people in the world. And of course, you don't even need a news article to tell us that. Many of us are already facing that. And then the last one, six in ten fathers are not taking paternity leave. To look after their children. Because many are afraid if they take leave, then they will be seen by their colleagues as you know you're not dedicated at work. So we don't live in a smart nation, we live in a stressed nation. Whether we are teenager or working adult or you're a retiree, chances are we are facing stress and problems in this life. So whether you are facing problems that you will face difficult project, difficult work, difficult boss, or we are helpless in our parenting and our marriage, or if you are facing strained relationships to deal with, cast all these big problems to God. So two quick suggestions for us to do. Okay, first, don't grumble when you are overwhelmed. Probably on Monday you will be overwhelmed. Already. Don't grumble when you are overwhelmed. Come quickly to God. Whenever you are, whenever you are overwhelmed and ask him to help you, not to react, not to grumble in frustration, not to complain. Psalms 46, verse 1, I heard Jonah quoted just now, says, God is our ever-present help in times of trouble. So go to him because he's always available and he's strong to help you. Second, we don't just focus on solutions, but intentionally, intentionally set aside time to pray and to commit the issue towards God. Or if you are the one giving counselling to someone, if you are going to learn more about physical counselling later on, 
If you are the one giving counseling, don't just focus on giving advice only. And forget to lead the person into prayer. What can we do? We can set aside pockets of our time to pray for the difficult situation in your mind. Whether you are jogging or you are travelling to work or to school, cast all your big problems to an even bigger God. Because He is a lot of big hands and He will fight for you. Now, as we come to the last section in chapter 15, what is the application after seeing such a great salvation from God? Chapter 15 is about a song of Moses and it's actually the application for chapter 14. Okay, so, thankfully, for the last application, I don't have to think very hard. It's just chapter 15 is up. It's it's the application is to sing of God's praises. So Moses becomes the worship chairman, and the congregation sings the song of Moses. And it happens to be the, the first song of the Bible that is recorded for us. So here lastly we find the Lord is your salvation. The Lord is your salvation. In chapter 15, verse 1 to 21. Now, if you look at the Song of Moses, you notice that this is a very personal song. Having experienced God's salvation firsthand, the Israelites sang in verse 2. What did they sing? Not just that the Lord is strong, even though that would have been true. Not just that. They say, they say the Lord is my strength, and my song has become my salvation. So it's not just head knowledge of who God is but a personal, intimate knowledge about God who has delivered them, He has fought for them and He has done exactly what He has promised. Only when we have trusted Him and God has brought us out of our difficulties can we sing, The Lord is my strength, my song and my salvation. And so very quickly for the rest of chapter 15, I just want to point out two things in the Song of Moses about what the Exodus meant to the Israelites and also what it should mean for us. So first it is about faith. They sang about God's glorious victory over his enemies. You can find this from verse 1 to 12. God's glorious victory over his enemies. So verse 1 to 3 tells us, God is a victorious warrior who has triumphed gloriously over the Egyptians. Verse 1 to 3. The remaining verses tell us 